There's so much to talk about. It's just such a fascinating time in China-Africa relations right now. So I, I hope that an hour will, will be enough for us to cover everything. Um, but maybe to kick things off, I thought we'd take a step back and do a little bit of um, scene setting. Because when we hear China-Africa relations, there is a tendency sometimes to think about, oh gosh, this is really new. This is novel. These relations, this is happening for the first time. Um, but this isn't new. Uh, China has had relations uh, of various kinds with various African states dating back as far as the Ming Dynasty. At the time, it was trading with Kenya and Somalia. And maybe more in recent history, we can look at that period from the 1950s to the 1970s when Beijing was very actively courting then the newly independent African states uh, economically as well and, and also politically with, I think, some, um, some mixed successes. But I would love your thoughts maybe to, to kick things off about how should we be thinking about what we're looking at today um, in that broader context of China's relations with the continent over the years? Yeah, that's a great place to start because China's relationship in Africa has gone through waves and we're about to embark on a new wave right now, but it's gone through these phases. Uh, so going, we'll, we'll kind of stop, we won't go back all the way to the 15th century in Zhenghe, but what we will do is let's kind of fast forward to the 1950s to 1970s, which was an ideological wave. That was clearly when Mao was trying to export communism and revolution. Uh, that was the building of the Tazara Railway, which was really one of the big first infrastructure projects that China built in Africa. Again, that was very ideologically driven. It then went as China kind of turned inwards during the Cultural Revolution and kind of the aftermath of the Cultural Revolution. They kind of went, you know, quiet in Africa for quite some time until let's kind of bring us up to the Hu Jintao period and the China going out. And that's where we start to see the first stages of what we're experiencing today, which was this idea that China wanted to go out into the world to find you know, new opportunities for its state-owned enterprises, new markets for its goods. It was starting to build up some excess capacity and it wanted to kind of you know, feel its way across the river, as they say. And Africa presented a very, very low barrier to entry market. Unlike, say, Central Asia, which was still very complicated by Russia's influence, Europe is very expensive, the U.S. is complicated for a lot of reasons. Here in Asia, the historical complexities make it difficult for China to go out. Africa was sitting there as basically, you could do it. And this was a time also that the United States and Europe have taken their eye off of Africa. So this was, there was, again, very little resistance to them coming in. And at that time, they needed the oil, mineral, and timber that Africa was selling, and they really weren't buying from other places. So that's the first phase, the first stage of our modern era in the China-Africa relationship. Yeah, and maybe that's a great place, because I'd love to spend a little bit of time on that, the oil and the resources, um, and kind of breaking that down a little bit, breaking down some of the investments in that space, because I think, and we can get to this later in the conversation as well, I think we're also seeing a diversification of uh, Chinese investments and of the investment landscape. But I think the first thing that comes to mind when both, most people think about China, Africa, and Chinese investments in Africa is very much that resource heavy oil extraction side of the equation. Can you maybe give us a little bit of color on mm. some of the dynamics there? And of course, they, they vary from country to, to country as well. Yeah, it does vary a lot. But so again, the relationship for most people is one they think of of resource and trade, resource extraction and trade. And that was in fact the early stages of all of this. So 70% of the trade that's done between China and Africa is concentrated into oil, to three categories of products, oil, mineral, and timber. Uh, most of that comes from 10 African countries. So it's a highly unequal relationship. Uh, chi China is not trading equally with the continent. China is not investing equally in the continent. One other very, very important distinction to make that a lot of people make this mistake. They confuse the words trade and investment. So China is Africa's largest trading partner. It is the largest partner of about 40 some odd countries. Uh, Africa does trade more with the European Union than China, but China's the largest country partner. So very important. But when it comes to FDI, China's actually down the list a little bit. Uh, so the United States remains the number one source of, of FDI. Uh, depending on how you count it, the UAE, even Malaysia, and France are also much higher. China's been moving up, but in investment, China's been very, very light. Because remember, all of these infrastructure projects that China's building, they're not investing. Those are funded by loans and concessional grants and lots of complex tools, but it's not an investment. 
So I think that's just a very important kind of scene setting distinction to make because a lot of people kind of confuse those two. Absolutely. And in the context of those loans, there's been a, a good deal of attention, especially recently now in the context of, of COVID, maybe we can fast forward a little bit about some of the terms and some of the conditions of those loans. We hear about debt traps, China's debt trap diplomacy, that these large infrastructure projects are basically burdening African economies um, even more so than, than they otherwise would be. What are some of your thoughts on that? What are some of your reflections on, on some of the narratives around these, mm. uh, these loans? So there's, there's a lot of, in, this is going on today, I mean, a lot of discussions. The United States has been pushing the debt trap narrative quite aggressively, not just in Africa, but around the world. Uh, we have to kind of put it right out there. Uh, scholars like Deborah Braudigam and many others have been looking at this issue upside down, left and right, you name it. There is no evidence of the debt trap narrative as it's been laid out by the American government. I think that's just a really important, that is, and the debt trap, just for those of you not familiar with it, is this idea that China loads up countries with unsustainable amounts of debt. It knows that these countries can't repay them, so what it does in lieu of payment is it seizes an asset. Now, if you talk to the Chinese, they go, this is, this is not the way we work. And I've talked to people at the Exim Bank, I've talked to people in think tanks, they go, why would we want to own these assets when, you know, who gets paid back in bankruptcy first? It's not the owner, it's the investor. And it's just, again, it's just a big misreading of the way that people approach the Chinese, you know, strategy on loans and debt. Let's go, let's go back to the African side of this, because too often in this, in this discussion, it's framed as China doing something to Africa. And Africans are stripped of agency, Africans are stripped of their identity, and again, Africans are made to be the victims in all of this. What is China doing to Africa? And that is really a, a very harmful way of looking at this relationship, because Africa absolutely has agency in all of this. And one of the things that they told the Chinese up front when this all started back in the mid-2000s was, we are tired of charity and aid. We've had a half century of this from the US and Europe, and it hasn't worked. We want to try something different. We don't want you to give us the money. This was a very clear instruction that came from African stakeholders. And so the Chinese said, great, because we don't like to do aid either. So we're going to do these very, very low interest, long-term concessional loans. Sometimes they're priced well, sometimes they're not. But at the end of the day, it's never intended to be aid. And that, to me, is a maturation of Africa's engagement with the outside world. And what comes with a loan, whether it's you get a car loan or I get a house loan, there's collateral with it. That is the nature of a loan. And one of the most interesting things about the discussion that we've seen is that when people see the contracts and they see collateral in it, they go, shock, horror, amazing. How can you have collateral for a loan? Or they'll say, people, you know, the Chinese will want something in exchange for the debt. Well, yes, because that's what lenders do. That is the natural relationship. Now, the interesting thing, and again, we go back to Deborah Braudigam and the China-Africa Research Initiative, and there's a lot of scholars who look at this. There is not any evidence right now, and Venezuela is really the best example of this, of the Chinese crushing these countries with debt and then exacting kind of painful extractions out of them. We haven't seen that. That said, a lot of the deals as they've been structured uh, are oftentimes not in the favor of Africans. That's just the nature of the fact that China, oftentimes when it negotiates with a Ghana, with Botswana, with these smaller countries, is able to extract terms that are far better and in its favor. But that has less to do actually with China and more to do with the power dynamic that exists between a wealthy country and a non-wealthy country. So that also is a very similar dynamic what we see in France's relationship and the U.S. relationship in Africa as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm so glad that you brought this aspect of agency up because this is one in my work on the issue, one that I've kind of been pushing and uh, trying to bring to the fore as well, because it's absolutely the case that African countries and in different ways, you know, Angola engages with Beijing in a different way than uh, Ethiopia and Ahmed now, Melas before engages with uh, Beijing because the structure of the countries is different. Their economic makeup is different. Their interests are also different. So of course, that relationship is going to vary from, from place to place. And it's absolutely true that you do see over time, um, or not even over time, since the very beginning, you've seen African governments negotiating with Beijing, um, sometimes successfully, sometimes not. But as you say, that's also the nature, that's kind of the nature uh, of the game as well. 
Um, on this point of civil society, I think that that's an interesting one that, that you bring in. Um, and because there's also been the sense on this point of China doing things to, uh, to Africa and to Africans, I think that sentiment has been particularly strong among uh, civil society. And so in some cases in Kenya, uh, on the context of the, on the standard gouge railway, there were protests and pushback uh, against some of the terms of the agreement signed there. But I think that African civil society, especially now in the context of, of COVID maybe, is starting to come into the equation uh, in a very interesting way as well. Are you seeing more of an alignment now? What are some of the civil society dynamics that you're seeing? Wow, I mean, and, and, and I wanna to talk to you about this because I wanna give my take and then I wanna hear from you on this. So we are seeing right now, and again, we talked about these different phases in the relationship. And we are at a point right now where we are embarking on yet another phase. And there's this chasm, I've called it a rupture uh, in the relationship. And it's particularly on the civil society. So China's done an exceptionally good job over the years at building relationships with Africa's governing class and continues to do so. And the governing class is defined as not just leaders, but also state-owned media, state-owned enterprises in a place like South Africa. It's also party-to-party -party relationships. So the ANC and the CCP have become very close. There's legislative relationships that they've done a lot of build of cross kind of party building with. Uh, also provincial, province to province. A lot of stakeholders beyond the central government are involved in this. So you'll see, you know, you know, Guangdong province will have a whole Africa trade office and they'll send delegations over and they'll work with a province in Angola. And so, but those in the governing elite class, where China has had a much more difficult time, and to be fair, to be fair, this is not unique to China. The United States also has a difficult time in building civil society relationships, particularly now in the Trump administration, but also during the Iraq war, and also we've been a very controversial power as well. So this is not necessarily unique to China, but we are seeing this chasm open up. And it really came, it just, it's been building for a long time. But what happened in Guangzhou over about last month, about four or five weeks ago, just brought it to the fore. And what ended up happening in Guangzhou was these, these images came flooding onto African social media on Facebook and on Twitter of Africans being pushed out onto the streets, of Africans being evicted, of Africans being mistreated, lots of demeaning, degrading videos of people who were really struggling to kind of get through the COVID kind of experience in Guangzhou. There are a lot, we don't have time to kind of go into all the details of it. In fact, we have a great podcast coming out tomorrow all about that. So I'll do a little tease on that. But what it did is it just in, enraged uh, African youth. And remember, Africa is a continent where the median age is 19.7 years old. This is so civil society is inherently young. And again, so when China is kind of saying we don't discriminate, we don't tolerate racism, what they are saying is that on the state level, the policy level, that may be true. And what we've seen in the past five weeks is that Guang, the Guangdong province and Guangzhou city authorities have actually made a big effort to try and remedy what happened. What's the problem is though, is that we're seeing videos from McDonald's, we're seeing videos from the civil society in China where there's blatant discrimination. And those two worlds don't talk to each other. Mm -hmm. And so the Chinese are talking on a state level and African civil society is talking about on a social media level, and boy, they are at loggerheads right now, and we're seeing this chasm grow wider and wider. And one of the things that I'm kind of forecasting right now is that China is demonstrating a complete incompetence in its ability to tap into civil society, to engage civil society. Their rigid way of communicating, this top-down narrative that comes from Beijing, this repetition of kind of party talking points, it's just not working. And what's happening is that views are hardening on both sides. So we saw just last Monday, the emergence of a one day online protest under the hashtag Black China, where countless people switched their profile pictures to a black version of the Chinese flag. Uh, that again is a demonstration of the frustration and the exhaustion that a lot of people have in dealing with this and a hardening of the position. Similarly, what we saw out of the Nigerian House of Representatives last week, unprecedented where Representative Benjamin Kalu stood up and said, basically, I'm introducing a motion that was backed by nine other representatives that moves to check the immigration status of every single Nigerian in the country of Nigeria, uh, every single Chinese in the country of Nigeria. Wow. I mean, that, again, is a reflection of this frustration and this anger. 
And it just, they seem to be diverging further and further on that side. So one of the kind of the forecasting trends we're seeing is more and more divergence on the civil society level. But my question for you, Alexander, as someone who's looked at this, is as an expression of agency, some people will say, well, this is the expression of agency, that Africans are standing up, pushing themselves. And other scholars will actually say, this is an expression of weakness, because there is no other tool that, that the weak and the powerless have against the strong. And so by using social media, by using oftentimes even fake videos on social media, impartial, incomplete truths, it's an expression of powerlessness rather than expression of strength. So when we look at the rage that's coming out of big parts of the black diaspora and African diaspora and African civil society, do you see this as something that is an expression of strength or weakness? I think it's difficult to answer such binary questions because it's probably both in some ways. Um, and I think what's fascinating is that you have increasingly communities in Ethiopia, in Kenya, in South Africa, Nigeria, of course, that are using the variety of tools that are available to them, social media, of course, being one, the tech scene in many of these African countries has just taken off over the last years. Um, and so you have these younger populations that are taking to those technologies, to those platforms, to push back and to engage this, this narrative in, in a way. And so I think it's, it's probably a little bit of both, but I personally tend to see it as a sign of strength because in previous years, you never really saw to this extent civil society across the board standing up this vehemently and this aggressively and this boldly um, to China. There were murmurs, you would have protests um, in response to uh, some aspects of aid or investments or displeasure over some labor issues. So you had little murmurs here and there. But I think this is, at least from the time that I've been watching this issue, the first time that you kind of see it, I, I hesitate to say collectively, but at scale, um, and, and holding China accountable, openly so. I mean, the, the fascinating thing with what you mentioned in, in Nigeria as well is not only um, that the, the, this motion came through to, in the legislature, but on the back of some of the events that happened in Guangzhou, uh, China, uh, excuse me, African officials were bringing in Chinese ambassadors and kind of openly uh, berating them and, and standing up to them in that way as well. So I think that it is in a way an expression of, of strength because it's happening on, on such a vast scale that we haven't seen. Um, uh, but, we haven't but why seen are they doing this? But why now and why China? And I, I lived, yeah. I grew up in Paris. I've lived in France for a long time. I'm the former editor-in-chief of France 24. I've covered French <laughs> society for a long time. The treatment of Africans in the banlieue by the CRS and by others and the levels of discrimination are considerably higher and more frequent than what we've seen out of China. Now, again, I'm, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not trying to excuse, rationalize, discount anything that's happened in China. What I find interesting as an observer, though, is that there are far more blatant, more aggressive expressions of racism, discrimination, violence, anti-blackness in the United States and in, 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 in Europe than there are from what we've seen out of China. But China seemed to trigger something. What do you think that is? I think China, in some cases, just has the unfortunate case of just being there. Um, and when there's anger, sometimes there, I mean, we see this in the US, we see this in Europe now as well. In some cases, there's pent up anger. Uh, there's frustration and people are angry. And in some cases, they don't know entirely what they're angry at. Um, and so that anger tends to be directed at the first thing that they see or the thing that they might hear about the most. And I think in many African countries, one of those first things is China. So I agree with you 100% that it's, it's of course terrible, but there are other instances and examples of much worse discrimination. Um, but China finds itself in the spotlight in the African continent for um, a bunch of different reasons that, that we're discussing here today. So I think part of that is um, just bad luck, frankly. Um, and there are a bunch of other dynamics at play as well, but, but just bad luck. We have a question here, actually, that kind of starts to dovetail with some of what you yeah. and I have been um, mentioning. It goes back a little bit to this, uh, we, you and I, we were discussing a little bit social media um, and the role that that has started to play. And we have about a question about tech 
and the role of technology in the China-Africa relationship. I know you and I are both uh, a bit closet tech nerds, maybe not closet yes. anymore. I'm not a closet tech nerd. I'm an out front tech nerd. So yes, I go. love it too. So I love your thoughts and we can kind of let the conversation weave on the role of technology, perhaps yeah. also in the context of what we've been talking about now. It's ironic that all of this that we're talking about in terms of the, the kind of uprising of African civil society and youth is happening on the back of Chinese built networks and using Chinese phones. So there is a certain irony there that, that the, the, the African tech kind of environment today is absolutely inseparable from China's investment in it. So 70% of the 4G network has been built by Huawei. Huawei is absolutely instrumental in, in, in the African digital story. Uh, ZTE is also there. Uh, but so let's start with the infrastructure and the network infrastructure. What mm. you cannot underestimate is the power of this. And, and again, and, and this is the soft power. So when we talk about Chinese soft power, oftentimes people think of soft power in the form of like Hollywood movies, Beyonce and things like that. <laughs> in many parts of Africa that I've traveled in, when I talk to people about China, what, the, what people will do, particularly young people, is they'll take out their phone yep. and they'll say, I love China and I love Huawei, I love Techno, I love Boomplay, I love all of these Chinese tech brands that they've bought. Because why? Because they're teenagers and oftentimes teenagers see the world through tech and they value that. But also people know the fact that without Huawei, there is no alternative. And this is the big failing of the US approach and the US criticism on Huawei. The United States will go to a Safaricom or it will go to a government in Africa and say, you shouldn't use Huawei because it's dangerous, okay? And Safaricom will say, well, great, what do you want me to do? I've got $50 million worth of Huawei gear. Do you want me to rip that out? Are you going to provide me an equivalent from Ericsson or Samsung and then the financing and then the installation and the whole package? What the Chinese have been able to do is come up with the development model that's a turnkey model. And what they do is they will come in with Huawei equipment, Huawei financing, Huawei engineers, and they will get that thing going. And that's been absolutely critical. But now what we're seeing in the tech space is gone beyond just Huawei. That is the very simplistic basic. That was a five-year-old story. Mm -hmm. but the story is today is Boomplay, 62 million customers. They're crushing Spotify, crushing Apple Music. Nowhere else in the world does that happen. Uh, that's a streaming music service. We're looking at Opay, Pompay. These are the new kind of uh, mobile service, mobile money, uh, mobile uh, you know, ride hailing in Nigeria. Venture capital is now starting to come in and venture capital money is investing in uh, lorry systems, which is a uh, Uber for trucks in Kenya. And then we've got Transin. And Transin is really the most important story in tech right now uh, that very few people understand. It's a Shenzhen based company. It just went public on the Shanghai Star Exchange last year, got a valuation of $7 billion, mostly from selling phones in Africa. 52.5, uh, 53 percent of the entire African mobile phone market is Transin. It is remarkable. They are the dominant player in both smartphones and feature phones. And Transin also has a walled garden, just like Apple does, that if you want to get an app on the Transin OS, you have to then accommodate to the way that they do things. Transin is also building out all these other services like Boomplay. They are a funder with Boomplay. They're doing finance. They're doing all these different things. And so Transin is the big player. Then the other part of it is let's talk about start times. 37 countries, 33 million uh, pay TV subscribers. Uh, they're now producing original content. But Star Times arguably is the most important media company now in Africa. So 33 million homes, four or five people minimum per home. We're looking at a brand that touches 100 million people a day. Uh, that is a very, very important uh, you know, player as well. And then there's all the other social media. So TikTok, which is owned by ByteDance, is now coming in. There's another short media service called uh, Viscuit that's there, 10 million users. Uh, Opera is the number two mobile browser in the market. That's owned by a Chinese company. Uh, so the tech space is really inseparable from China. And all the things we've talked about on the civil society problems, tech will continue to take off. Uh, quite a bit. And it's a space that really the West and Europe have not been able to compete anywhere near with the effectiveness of what the Chinese have been able to do. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, 
actually a question on the back of that in the context of these larger scale investments that I think tend to come to mind when we think about Chinese investments, the roads, the bridges, so on and so forth. There's often been the sentiment, um, I think rightly so, from European and American companies that, gosh, we don't have the means to compete on that level. We can't compete with China when it comes to those kinds of projects. With this widening now that we're talking about a little bit of the investment landscape, as you say, to tech, there's more VC funds coming in. Is this, in your view, posing now even more of a challenge for European and American companies? Or is this now kind of, in a way, leveling the playing field, so to speak, so an opening perhaps opportunities for European companies to, or VC, European VC funds to also come into African markets and be competitive vis-a-vis -vis China? Yes and no. So let's not, well, the Chinese oftentimes get a lot of the headlines and a lot of the attention because they are the new kid on the block. Uh, at the end of the day, Visa International, the credit card company, invested far more alone than, than the Chinese did last year. Uh, so American VC and American investment is still very, very active in Africa. And that's, again, go back to the fact that Americans are still the number one source of investment for Africa. We always seem to forget that America's role is actually still instrumental in Africa, even though they don't get the press and the attention for it. Uh, that being said, the Chinese are able to compete in spaces where the Americans simply can't. That is the merger of hardware and software. That's where a company like Techno and Star Times have done so well, is they're able to build low cost products using the very, very cheap manufacturing operations that they have in places like Guangdong province and being able to kind of custom build products specifically for the African market. Techno's success is built entirely on the fact that they build phones and services specifically for Africans. Apple does not do that. Uh, Samsung is starting to do it to a certain degree, but at the end of the day, these companies are looking for higher yields and higher profit margins than what the Chinese are accustomed to. You know, Chinese can be very happy with three to 5% for a very long time. Apple won't get out of bed for that. And so that is one of the big problems that, that these companies have is that the profit margins are oftentimes in the single digits. But yet the Chinese have found a very, very effective model at making a lot of money off of single digits and gobbling up market share early on. And again, the Chinese sense of time in Africa is also very, very different. It always shocks me when I talk to Chinese investors in Africa and they're looking at 50 year horizons. It's just, who thinks in, 50, in terms of half centuries? I mean, that is remarkable, 25, 50 years they're looking at. So the bumps in the road that we see now, for them, they're pretty chill about it quite a bit. We think in terms of quarters and years. And so we look at these difficulties now and think, Henny Penny, the sky is falling, we're gonna pull out or we're gonna do something. Uh, they don't see it that way, a lot of this, particularly some of the state-owned enterprises. So, but yet, that being said, we saw the first quarter data, Global Data, which is a, a London uh, analytics firm, just released first quarter M&A data from China. Mm -hmm. Lots of outbound M&A coming, none of it going to Africa. Europe, North America, the Mideast. So again, Africa may be fading in terms of its popularity with China simply because the risk profile uh, may be too high and the returns now you can get because everything is on sale right now. Everything's on sale in Europe, in the US, in the Middle East. And so we're seeing cash rich Chinese companies going out and maybe gonna do a lot of acquisitions, but Africa is not necessarily the place they're going to go. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's going to be fascinating to watch the dynamics that unfold on the back of the situation that we're in now and, and how these shifts are going to, to play out. One more point on the tech question, then we can move the conversation along. Inevitably, when there is mention of Huawei and ZTE and these big players laying infrastructure, uh, apps, mobile phones, so on and so forth, Inevitably, one of the questions that comes up or one of the red lights that goes off is, oh gosh, surveillance, yeah. uh, tech uh, surveillance. Uh, there was a story in Zimbabwe several years ago with Cloudwalk that there was a deal signed for uh, the company to uh, that offered AI services to the Zimbabwean government to build out certain infrastructures. And then there was kind of in that deal, it turned out that some of that AI data was of course being sent back to Cloudwalk to improve its AI systems, which to some extent was shocking, some extent not really that surprising. Um, in your discussions with uh, African, African, is this something that uh, the narratives that we hear here in Europe and in the US about surveillance, do these translate on the ground as well or is that not so much of a concern? 
Listen, I think a certain degree of privacy is a concern, but privacy means different things to different people. So here in Vietnam, privacy means something very different than it does to you in Switzerland and than it does in the United States. And oftentimes I think that we in the US and Europe uh, look at our views on privacy or rights or civil rights and all of this as universal values, in part because a lot of these are ensconced in United Nations values, but those were actually written by Western powers, so therefore they are presumed to be international. Again, I don't want to dismiss the idea that privacy and surveillance are not concerns to people in emerging markets. However, people in emerging markets weigh the different options. Do we take Huawei and say, take a risk on surveillance or do we take nothing? Because that is in fact the choice. This is not a choice between buying Ericsson equipment and buying Huawei equipment, simply because Ericsson equipment is not coming with the financing that actually makes the equipment possible. And so a lot of people, and even the head of Safaricom has said, listen, there may be surveillance issues. It's just not our top priority right now. Getting people connected affordably is the top priority because it is at the end of the day for a lot of people in emerging markets like Africa, a binary choice. You either have it or you don't. And people say, I would have it. And you saw the reaction after the Le Monde article that came out a couple of years ago about did the Chinese uh, and using Huawei equipment spy on the African Union. Right. And it was very interesting to hear leaders like Paul Kagame who probably said, yeah, maybe it happened because you know, at the end of the day, that's what big powers do. Certainly as an American, we spied, I think what we tapped Angela Merkel's phone, we tapped the entire country of Spain, we tapped the entire country of Mexico. You know, and they, I think there's a certain pragmatism that we heard from African leaders that go, yeah, you know, maybe it happens, maybe it doesn't, I don't know. That being said on the AI side, and that is growing very, very fast, there are some reasons to be worried here because the equipment is being installed and again, Huawei doesn't have, or any of these companies, they don't put any kind of value on who they're installing it for. So they install it for dictator X, dictator Y, whatever. They don't care. They don't care. They will turn the key, cash the checks and walk away. So one of the things the Wall Street Journal is reporting out of Uganda and Zambia was misuse of Huawei surveillance equipment. Uh, we also have seen, for example, now uh, you talked about Zimbabwe, uh, Huawei just announced this week that the entire central business district is now under full CCTV coverage uh, using Huawei Smart City. That is an AI application. Mm -hmm. uh, Vision, which is one of the state-owned uh, surveillance companies, has had a representative office in South Africa for quite some time. And one of the things they want to do in Africa is kind of help improve the overall algorithms for AI. Uh, algor AI algorithms still struggle with darker complexions. And that is a race and that is a challenge that AI companies in Europe and the US are struggling with as well. And so the Chinese kind of thought, listen, let's go to Zimbabwe, let's go to South Africa, let's kind of offer our equipment for free. As you said, with CloudWalk, they wanted to kind of take the data back. And for them, what they wanted to do, my understanding was to use it to perfect their algorithms. I don't think that there was any indication that they cared on what Joe and Jane Zim Zimbabwean was actually doing. Now, at the end of the day, we go back to this agency question, which is, who is doing what to whom? So one of the, the issues in China-Africa relations today is that a lot of the civil society, the guy on the street, he has as much distrust of his own government as he does of the Chinese. And one of the things that he thinks, and there's some reason, there's good reason to think this, is that Chinese are in collusion with governing elites to screw him. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things you see as much distrust towards their own government as they do the Chinese. And this AI and these tech questions kind of play into that. That being said, the average 19-year-old who, and again, median age in Africa is 19.7, uh, seems to prefer using the techno phones, the boom play services, and is making the concessions on the privacy side. And I will be honest with you, that is the same trade-off that we have made with Google, Facebook, Twitter in the West as well. So there's really no difference on that. We have foregone a lot of our privacy as well. Absolutely, and I feel that that could be an entire uh, podcast, an entire webcast in and of itself. But you alluded, Eric, to um, this kind of China perhaps pulling back a little bit from Africa economically, Africa perhaps playing not as significant of a role um, in, that, in Beijing's calculus when it comes to the econ side of things. So then with that said, what role do you see Africa playing more of, if any role, um, if, yeah. if, as you say, this dynamic is shifting? 
So this is actually something that we started to see going back to 2015, 2016. So remember early on in the early mid 2000s when China was first going out, it didn't have a lot of opportunities and a lot of options on where it could source raw materials, markets and do things like that. A lot has changed from the mid 2000s to now. The Belt and Road now is a real thing, whatever the Belt and Road is. I mean, I don't know what it is, but it's a thing. Uh, it's out there. Hundreds of billions of dollars have been spent, markets have been opened. And so we started to see now this diversification away from Africa. So the, uh, you know, the buying of oil, for example, that was so prominent in Angola with the Angola model and in South Sudan and in Sudan and the Sudanese as well. Uh, now, uh, Chinese oil buying out of Saudi Arabia went up last year by 47%. They don't need to go to Africa for the oil, mineral, and timber. Uh, China does a third more trade, $300 billion with South America than it does with China, uh, with Africa. Right. It has expanded its trade with Europe. It's expanding into Central Europe, Central Asia. Uh, so it's got a lot more options. And one of the most fascinating things that we've seen now is that for many Africans, they frame their relationship with the outside world in economic terms because that's the way it's been for four or 500 years. That the Europeans and the Americans have largely seen their engagement with Africa either in the form of exploitation of resources, war and ideological struggle as it was in the Cold War, or uh, aid and humanitarian development. The Chinese don't really want to do any of that. And, and, this is, and this is unnerving for a lot of Africans because what we've seen is that they don't have the vocabulary right now to define their relationship with China. So what does China actually want from Africa? Mm -hmm. I'm going to make the argument, and this has been drawn heavily from a number of different professors like Professor Joshua Eisenman from the University of Notre Dame, who kind of talks about the evolution of the political military relationship. So what does the value of Africa bring to China today? What we saw just last week or the week before with the WHO and the United States pulling out and every single African leader for the most part standing up in defense of Tedros and the WHO, that's something that brings warmth and warm fuzzies to the Chinese who like that. When every African government for the most part tells the United States to buzz off on Huawei, when 17 African governments sign a letter supporting China's position on Xinjiang, when Uganda comes out proactively to support the Chinese position on Hong Kong, on the South China Sea. These core national interests for the Chinese are so important. I define them by, this is my acronym, 4THKXJ. Anybody listens to the podcast, you hear me say this quite a bit. Let's go through it. Taiwan, Tibet, Tiananmen Square, the party, Hong Kong, Xinjiang. That's what's important to China. And when they see this coalition of 54 African votes that do kind of oftentimes work together as we saw at the Food and Agriculture Organization last year, where the entire African bloc voted for the Chinese candidate on the first round. The Cameroonian candidate withdrew so that the Chinese could actually have a, their candidate up against the Americans. That's the value, I think, that we're going to see more on with the Chinese in Africa. So this is why maybe the civil society tensions that we're seeing right now, maybe in the long run, they don't actually matter that much. Because maybe in the long run, you know, if people don't like the Chinese, I don't think Xi Jinping's going to lose any sleep over that. The Chinese have a very thick skin of people not liking them, whether it's Europeans hating them on Tibet, on human rights, whether it's Americans hating them for lots of different reasons. I'm not so sure that if an average 23-year-old in Nigerian doesn't like the Chinese and starts putting it out on Twitter, that that's going to make Xi Jinping lose much sleep when what he really wants is that 54, 55 block of votes at the United Nations, at World Health Organization to support Huawei standards. And now on the military side, which is China is the largest contributor of peacekeeping troops of any permanent member of the Security Council in Africa. China is expanding its influence in terms of military to military relationship. It's got the Djibouti base. It probably will not build other bases, but it will probably then sell more weapons. Uh, and that's something, a big trend that we've seen is China's increase of, of both large and small arms sales have gone up quite a bit in Africa. But that might be where this direction of this relationship is going, less to the all-encompassing, we want to be liked by everybody. And maybe they're just going to recognize the fact that people aren't going to like them. But if they get people to buy Huawei, they're happy.
Right, right. And we have actually have a question here. So I'm, I'm going to start picking a little bit. So please cool. feel free to submit questions as I know we'll take them as they come in. That kind of dovetails with this idea of China's relations with the continent becoming more um, political. And there's a tendency, uh, we think of Beijing, uh, we, well, when we think of China, we think of Beijing, this, this monolith, this entity that kind of behaves as, as a unitary actor. And there's a question here, which I think is actually quite interesting, about what role, if, if any, Chinese ambassadors or the, the Chinese uh, politicians on the ground in countries like Uganda, Rwanda, elsewhere, what role, if any, do they uh, play in, in, all of, in all of what you and I have been talking about? Oh, and it's funny. These are now, I mean, this is a controversial way of saying it, but they're the wolf warriors named after uh, that movie, you know, the Wolf Warrior 2 and Wolf Warrior 1 movies. Uh, but they are called the Wolf Warriors. Some academics like to discount that, but it is a kind of a funny thing. Uh, these, ad these Now for the first time in the past, I'd say 12 months, uh, Chinese ambassadors now have a, a visible presence in public diplomacy. This was not a phenomenon that we saw before 2019. And it really started with Ambassador Lin Songtian, the former ambassador to South Africa, who recently left. And he started getting out on Twitter last September. I mean, we're talking, these guys are on Twitter only about six or seven months. But holy moly, they are, they're taken to it like a fish in water. I mean, it's just hysterical to watch them on Twitter. And you can see them figuring out and learning at it. Uh, by the way, if you go to my Twitter at E. Olander, look at my lists. I have a list of every single Chinese diplomat and mission on Twitter. And it's a fascinating thing to actually look at every single day. I've and I use it to my, my, my newsletter together every day. Uh, but the, the, the ambassadors now are taking personalities, uh, taking on, and that is not something Chinese officials have done in the past. So Wu Peng, who is the Chinese ambassador to Kenya now, really outspoken and really much mirroring Kyle McCarter, who's the US ambassador mm -hmm. to Nairobi, who also is a very big personality. And so I'll give you an example. We had the Lamu uh, coal plant deal that fell apart last year. This was a $2 billion coal-fired power plant. China was providing the ICBC, which is the, the commercial bank, was providing about $1.2 billion of the funding. It was tagged as a Belt and Road China project. It was a coal project. And the environmental tribunal in Kenya shot it down. The week that it got shot down, Wu Peng came out with a statement, and he invited all of the activists who rallied against this to the embassy, took a picture with them and said, you know what? We support you and your decisions and whatever you wanna do. Everybody got blown away by the fact that he would do that. That same week, Kyle McCarter gets up and blasts the Kenyans for, you know, for not agreeing to use coal because Trump and the, the US administration are very pro-coal. And, uh, and it was just an amazing contrast in public diplomacy. Since then, we have seen ambassadors, whether it's Joe Pingjian in, uh, in Nairobi, we've, I mean, I'm sorry, in, in Nigeria, or we've seen uh, in, in Zhu Qing in, uh, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, really, again, take Twitter personalities, and, it is, and they are now actually becoming uh, pers you know, presences, and they're affecting policy in very dramatic ways. And I think it is something to watch. Uh, and something that we haven't really seen before. One very big difference between U.S. ambassadors and Chinese ambassadors, typically Chinese ambassadors, well, no, not typically, they are career foreign service, career foreign ministry uh, officials, whereas U.S. ambassadors uh, like Lana Marks in South Africa are appointees oftentimes and not necessarily career foreign service officers. So they come at it with a very, very different approach, uh, but they are very vocal and having a very dramatic impact on policy. Yeah, absolutely. And in your in your experience and your thinking, does this start to then kind of form this narrative about China's more uh, perhaps greater focus on uh, on soft power, on on political power? We have a question here about uh, whether or not China is kind of aware of its its soft power strengths or or weaknesses. Is the kind of um, I, I, promotion isn't the right word, but the elevation of ambassadors, uh, Chinese ambassadors as foreign policy actors, is that part of the soft power uh, narrative as well? Or is that something completely different? In your they've, got, they've got, you know, their soft power is very multifaceted. So they've got one part which is clumsy and awkward and, and really ineffective and stupid and dumb. And that is the, the huge expense that they put into like CGTN and to the propaganda apparatus. Now, 
the display of that content is rather just, again, I, I don't know who watches this, but like, somebody must be watching it, but they're spending a huge amount of money on it. But underneath the surface of this clumsy propaganda that they do is a very, very interesting, sophisticated op operation. That no one else in Africa has come to match. So a couple things, let me just talk about the media apparatus first. So they've got this, uh, you know, think of it as like a duck, above water and below water. The above water thing are Xinhua, Radio, China Radio International, China Daily, uh, China Africa, which is this magazine. Okay, we see that CGTN is the most visible thing. Again, everybody thinks, well, you know, France 24, RTV, VOA, everybody's got that. Uh, the fact is, though, that the Chinese have made big investments in production in Kenya. So there's a, a CGTN TV studio that's there with about 50 to 60 people. Xinhua is building up a capacity there as well. Then what they've done is they formed these relationships with African news sites. So Ghana Web, Daily Nation, Independent Online, a bunch of these sites, and they start feeding Xinhua content to it. Now, these news sites, like news sites everywhere around the world, are suffering uh, financially because uh, so much of that money has gone to Facebook and Google. Advertising is down. So China comes along and says, we'll give you a free newswire feed. Now, if you look at Xinhua, 85 to 90% of it is just boring newswire stuff. It's really not that interesting. But about 10% of it is the real thick, creamy Chinese propaganda that gets through. And that does make its way through. And we saw this system turn on with the Jack Ma donations. So as the Jack Ma donations were coming in, boy, African media sites were just really promoting it through automatic feeds. The other thing that they've done in Africa, which they haven't done anywhere else, is the China Africa Development Fund took a 20% stake in independent media in South Africa. So they actually own a part of it. We haven't seen that happen anywhere else in the world. And boy, oh boy, do you see uh, a lot of pro-Chinese content on IOL.za. Last thing, what they're doing now is that there is a, a, a variety of content that is sometimes identified as Chinese propaganda by Xinhua, by People's Daily on African media. Now we're starting to see some of that come off so people don't really know what the source is. And increasingly, News agencies are using Xinhua content just like they use Reuters and AP to rewrite it. So it has the feel and the theme of Xinhua, but it actually has an African journalist name on it. So all of a sudden, Chinese media now is actually getting into the ecosystem in ways that uh, other sources are not. And that's actually very, very sophisticated. Just very quickly, because I know we're running out of time. But again, that's defining soft power in the classic Joseph Nye terms, Absolutely. which is media and culture. But China's soft power is in many ways defined by its development story. And you and I both know, Alexandra, that China, when I first went there in 1989, uh, I, I had to go use food rations and food coupons. There was no coffee. Everybody basically was as poor or poorer than most African countries. And in my lifetime, China has gone from being as poor or poorer than most African countries to the second largest economy in the world. The power of that development story in Africa is enormous and cannot be overstated and is something that uh, people in the West discount simply because when we turn on the faucet, water comes out. Mm. That is not something that people in rural China or rural Africa have take, take for granted. And that development story is very, very powerful. Then there's also that tech story. The Huawei part, the techno part, the boom play part, start times, that is a form of soft power that is incredibly powerful, particularly for young people. Now, again, people can have two conflicting ideas at the same time. A lot of people loathe the United States and want to send their kids there for college and also want to make sure that they can immigrate there and they can have these contradictory feelings at the same time. And they have those same feelings about China. So don't mix just because they may hate the Chinese loans, they may hate the Chinese attitude and tone, but they really do admire the fact that 82,000 African students study in China get scholarships. I love the fact that China comes to Africa to recruit university students. Jack Ma now is an incredibly potent power of soft power, a symbol of soft power. Entrepreneurialism, technology, empowerment. He's not talking about aid and dependency and, and, and charity. He's talking about building up a tech sector with young entrepreneurs. And people love that message. So there is a lot that the audience here today 
and that people in Europe and the United States can learn from the Chinese messaging and the focus on infrastructure, on technology, and again, not on dependency through aid, which at the end of the day, for a lot of people, they, they resent the West and they resent the aid. And that's why there's a lot of tension also built up towards the US and Europe. But we just don't see it as visibly as we're seeing the Chinese right now. Absolutely. And I mean, to piggyback off of that as well, I think it's so important for those sitting in, in Europe and the US to maybe spend a little bit more time also engaging with what's happening in, on, on the ground in so many of these countries. Like you said, there is an up and coming or an existing already entrepreneurial scene, Nigeria, Kenya, South Africa, the tech scenes, the influencer scenes, the role of media, all Incredible. sorts of media. Absolutely. It's, 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 such so a dying, it's so exciting. And it, of course, I think it's also important, maybe we should have prefaced the, our whole conversation with this, but it's important to recall, right, when we speak about China and Africa, Africa is a continent of 54 different countries that vary amongst themselves incredibly and also internally as well. Northern Nigeria is very different from Southern Nigeria, and you've alluded to this as well. Um, China is also, I mean, a lot of what China, quote unquote, is doing in doing <laughs> in the African region, it also comes from provinces, from different corporations. It's a very multifaceted uh, story, as, as I've heard you call it uh, on several occasions, with many yeah. different plots and many different uh, narratives and many different actors. And I think that's part of what makes it fascinating and also makes it difficult for, for people to maybe wrap their head around because it's, it's neither here nor there. Yeah, you know, I, I put up on Twitter when the, the provincial governor of Zhejiang province was touring Rwanda and touring Africa, and I got a lot of feedback from Africans who said, why is this important? Who cares about a provincial governor? Well, it just turns out that Zhejiang province has a $3 trillion GDP which is larger than any African country, and it's the home of Alibaba and Hangzhou, and it, you know, it's, got, it's, got the, it's the home of Yiwu, which is this great trading port. And all of a sudden, you start listing out just what Zhejiang alone is and the relationship that it has with, China, with, with Africa. And people's eyes were just like, wow, this, this is really impressive. And so the Zhejiang governor is as important in many respects for, uh, for, for a country like Rwanda that now has these deep partnerships with Alibaba as is Xi Jinping at the central government level. And so we can't think of Africa as a, as a unitary actor, and we certainly can't think of China as a unitary actor either. They're incredibly diverse. And again, the last message that I, I kind of really want to leave everybody with is the good and the bad sit side by side with each other. If you think that the China-Africa relationship is bad for Africa, you are looking at only half the story. If you think that the China-Africa relationship is really, really good for Africa and you ignore the bad, you're only looking at half the story. Both are true at the same time. So whenever you hear people speak about it in polls, in these polarized contexts, and today, you know, it's hard to get away from that. Everybody, particularly around a topic like China, wants to kind of think it's good or it's bad. And I, would, I argue, and this is where I sit, and I think, Alexander, where you are as well, it's on a Tuesday, it's great. On a Wednesday, it's terrible. On a Thursday, it's eh. On a Friday, it's amazing. And it just is like that. And you can find points to support your position on both sides. But if you find comfort in that middle gray area, that's where the China-Africa exists in my, in my view. What's your yeah. take? I, I agree with you 100%. It, it varies uh, depending on where you're looking what you're looking at. Like we've said, the, the story is very different in, in Ethiopia and Ethiopian manufacturing than it is in the Kenyan tech sector, than it is in the Nigerian oil and gas sector. So it, it varies, it's nuanced, as you say, the good and bad sit next to each other. And I also don't think that that's particularly unique to, to the China-Africa story um, either. Often the good and bad sit next to each other. But I'm gonna let you get one more thought in, because we've covered, we've covered investment, we've covered tech, we've covered civil society, we've, we've kind of ran the gamut. Um, and we've alluded to the fact that this relationship, we're now in a period of flux, especially now COVID-19, and there are a bunch of issues around that that we didn't have a chance to touch on. But for those who are interested in these relations, those who are watching to see kind of what comes next, uh, we don't have a crystal ball, so I'm not gonna ask you what comes next, but what are you looking at? What are some of the dynamics that you're keeping an eye on to see where we go from here? So 
China, I mean, Africa is super important for China. And if you're following China globally, you're going to want to keep an eye on what's happening in Africa. They do things first in Africa before they do things elsewhere. The first military base, the first stake in a media company, the first Twitter accounts were, were in Africa. You see this as a test bed for their policies. You see this as a test bed for them trying new, new experiments in tech and in investing in lots of different things. And once they kind of do things in Africa in an exciting way, again, this is all not necessarily bad stuff. They then roll them out and you get like a little bit of a preview of what they're going to do in other parts of the world on the agencies, their donation policies, lots of different things. So I encourage you to keep an eye on the China-Africa relationship in part if you want to see what they're going to do in other parts of the world. This is a relationship that is absolutely in flux right now. It's changing. It's very, very rapid, changing very fast. Uh, it's fascinating to me as you see, we, Alexander, you and I could talk about this for five hours, An but hour I know everybody- uh, but I would like to invite everybody uh, to follow what we do at the China Africa Project. We have a podcast every week. We have a site. We're independent, nonpartisan. Uh, we're self-supported by subscribers to our newsletter. So we really try and take that middle ground. Uh, but it would be great to have everybody on this call in this, in this webinar to join our conversation. Um, I'll also give you my email address, eric at chinaafricaproject.com. I love talking with people about it. So if you want to email me, and you can find me on LinkedIn, on Twitter, on Facebook. Um, people are oftentimes surprised that they get massive emails back. <laughs> so, uh, but I would love to, to kind of engage everybody and really thank you for the opportunity. And Alexandra, it was wonderful to finally meet you in person. Finally, after a decade of stalking each other's work, now it, it was bound to happen. Thank you again to the Asia Society. I think that is a wonderful place to end. Eric, thank you so much for your time. It was such a pleasure. Um, and we look forward to continuing the conversation on all of the platforms that you've just uh, rattled off.